So I am thrilled today to be able to introduce to you my friend, Bill. He's my colleague. He's my friend. And he's, and he's, uh, he's even a client. And besides that, he's my mortgage broker. He's probably put together, I don't know, maybe seven loans for my family and for me, et cetera. He's also a graduate of Yale in chemistry, Bill. Oh, my gosh. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a med school dropout. A med school dropout. Your mother wanted you to become a doctor. And look what happened. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my doctor father and my grandfather doctor and my great grandfather doctor. They all wanted, wanted you to doctor. be a doctor. <laughs> and then NYU for your MBA. And yeah. then Wharton for uh, a certificate of some kind. Did advanced studies in marketing there. Advanced studies in marketing. And then you're currently right now, I know... This is, you know, I don't want to make you blush, but you're in the top 1% of all mortgage lenders in the country at this point. Uh, right. Yeah. So, you know, apparently you know what you're doing when it comes to the mortgage world. <laughs> One can I will, guess. Say, I will say I'm a lot more quantitative than most other people. And it's an industry that it's a lot of unknowns, even to the people in the industry. And I ferret out the answers because I always want to know for myself what's really true. And so I have a lot of attitudes that run contrary to what most brokers and bankers will say and think. And I think it's but, your contrary, I think it's your contrarian attitude that attracted me to you in the first place. <laughs> what almost 20 years ago when we first met. Anyway, so Bill, let me set up the first question here. Um, sure. You again are contrarian, and we're looking at a housing market that is unique in time. Um, we have the lowest inventory in history. It was already low before the pandemic. It was historically at low numbers. And now post-pandemic, I think we're at 40% of the number of houses that were on the market pre-pandemic. So there's just almost no inventory out there for people to buy. And of course, this is creating uh, real problems when somebody goes looking for a house and there's nothing available to buy. And when they finally find a good one, then you have all these people putting in bids and a lot of their cash bids. And you've developed a unique couple of methods for dealing with those bidding competitions to where, according to what I've heard you say, your, your clients commonly win those bids, even when they're cash bids. I, I focus less on race because my bank has among the lowest rates. So I take it for granted. We have the, most generous DTI and reserve requirements. We do, we'll do jumbo loans up to 55, 60% DTI, which is dramatically different than every other bank. That's a, so, a debt, debt to income, 50 to 60% debt to income. Right, we'll give you a, a quick real example of a client who was working with a realtor wanting to buy a house for 2.2 million, had gone to Wells Fargo, you know, W2, good credit, I mean, a solid borrower, but Wells did the, determination that they can only qualify for a purchase of a million nine because Wells has a 43 debt to income ratio on jumbos, which is industry standard. The realtor called me, um, one of her backups. Same day, we qualified the person for 2 million seven, $800,000 more solely because of our debt to income ratio is that much more generous. They got the house. So really because I've got that powerful bank behind me, I don't spend a lot of time talking about rates and debt to income qualifying. I, I, I tell my clients my main focus, and this is on purchases, of course, it, I, I can set aside the issues of who's quoting what in rates. All that matters is do you win the bid? That's right. it. Right. And, and so, yes, I've devised a couple of things that are in, in some ways necessarily unique because I'm involved, but they work. So, so, my the, clients, now, so I would like to correct one thing about the inventory. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There actually is a reasonable amount of inventory because we're doing transactions throughout the country every day. What, what you don't have is an inventory of homes that have been on the market for 15, 30, 45, 60 days. So the turn is what's really frightening. House comes on the market, even before it comes on the market, you've got people shopping and bidding on it, trying to get it taken off the market before it goes to the, you know, sort of an auction of bidders. So there is property out there, but you have to be prepared to jump on it when the moment arrives. 
let's see, um, I can't say it in French, or I can say it in French badly. Uh, Louis Pasteur is uh, the one who coined the phrase, chance favors the prepared mind. Right. And so luck happens, but if you're not ready for it, you don't recognize it, you're not going to take advantage of those opportunities. So I prep my clients in advance in a way that really, I had somebody go out the other day, saw a, uh, a moving truck on a street behind their house and knocked on the door and said, hey, we'll buy it. <laughs> well, <laughs> we, they were already prepared because they were already underwritten by me. So yeah. So now let's, so let's, let's take a, a two steps. Sure. One of the things that uh, that was unique when you first told me about this was you believe that the first call should be to the mortgage lender as opposed to the real estate agent, because you're probably one thing was, I think if I understood you right, you're going to be able to recommend a great agent, a good real estate agent who is going to be somebody who can find these opportunities. And that's one of the hardest parts of the entire process. As you just mentioned, you got to be prepared. And then there was this other reason, which I think is the big one, which is pre-qualification, but at a whole new a whole new level. Well, how does that work? Right. So regarding the realtor, I don't know any realtor that will start working with a client unless that client has been to some kind of bank or broker to be pre-approved. The, the realtor has to know that the person can actually have the financial wherewithal to, to close on the home if they're bidding. So if they don't already have a mortgage person, the realtor generally has some favored preferred lender they can send them to. So you could start with the realtor, but you're going to have to talk to a finance before the realtor is going to do any work for you. Now, it's very hard to get statistics in my industry, but according to the National Association of Realtors, more than 90% of the people that uh, bid on homes have done their own shopping online and found them. Now, they might have found them with the help of a realtor, but everybody's online looking at property. Of course. Now, not every property is listed. So there's off-market sales and what are called pocket listings. But generally speaking, people are aware of what inventory is in the market now. It's sort of, a, sort of a sad game because now the sellers know people are out there looking for homes. So a strategy which in a very perverse way I admire, a lot of listing agents will list a give an example, a uh, hypothetical. Let's say there's a single family home in the Pacific Palisades, which is a very blue chip area of Los Angeles. And they'll list a 3,000 square foot home for a million three. You, you literally, people get hundreds of people showing up. Hundreds, that yes. Because <laughs> that would be a two million five, maybe, or something. They think they found, yeah, they think they found this great deal they did their shopping, they jumped on it, and it was never going to go for million three. It's going to go for two million five. So what the listing agent's done, the listing agent is the person who sells the home. What the listing agent has done is created a groundswell of activity. It benefits them in some ways. I don't know that it really does get them a higher price than they would have gotten in the market because there's still fair value in the market. Right. But what it does do, it makes them look good to their seller. That, oh my God, look at the opportunities. It does create something of a bidding war and maybe it gets them a little bit extra. I'm not at all convinced that there's no way to, uh, there's no objective standard way to measure it. But what it also does for the seller is, let's say you have 50 people lined up at the house. The, let's say one of them is gonna get the house. You now have 49 people who are buyers who didn't get the house. <laughs> and a good percentage of them probably don't have a realtor. So the listing agent can use this tactic to develop new leads for themselves. Right. Like I said, kind of kind of clever, kind of schemy, but it gives many people the wrong impression that they can do these this shopping for home really without the help of a realtor. I think that they're under if they're undervaluing how much a really good realtor can do for them. Yeah, yeah. In, in LA County, I, I can't get the number straight too, the 25,000 or 95,000 licensed realtors. Oh, I think it's like 90,000 because I think there's 300,000 in California, something like that. 
Yeah, there's a lot. Yes. Uh, we moved on to a block with 26 homes. Yeah. There's five realtors on my block. I mean, yeah, right. Uh, and they're friendly with me because they don't know my wife's a realtor. So, <laughs> yeah. um, so they're all over. They're not, obviously, they're not all the Great. same. Yeah. I find the commonality features are they're extroverts, they're outgoing, they're fun. They'll put you on lists to look at homes, they can drive you around, they can do transactions anywhere. They're probably very good looking, both men and women. This is a hard to Well, for anybody in any industry, it's very difficult to evaluate the skill of someone if you're not in that industry. Right. You know, a lawyer can talk to a lawyer in the same field and know in 10 minutes, or an accountant, or a, any, any form of executive. How do you evaluate how good the, the realtor is? Well, somebody referred them, they had good success. Well, I have over 900 realtors. I obviously don't work with them all actively, but I've, I do hear from them. I only ever refer business to eight. <laughs> what distinguishes those eight there's an, if i if you saw them in a police lineup you know you you chortle they're, you know like short fat and dumpy to tall skinny and lanky to those that they're, they're, they have a lot of those common features i've mentioned they're outgoing and stuff but what i found over time what distinguishes them their clients win bids and like i said that's all i care about so if a client doesn't have a realtor or isn't having success with their realtor or not just getting a bad job. Um, I'll never suggest in advance to use a realtor that I, but if they come to me, I will give them one of these eight. And there's some geographic distribution. In if you want to be in Topanga or on the West side or sorry, the Valley, in different parts of Los Angeles, I might lean towards one over the others, but how each of these people is successful. They're, Remember Patty Duke? Their difference is night and day, you know. Yeah. Uh, so the only thing in common is that their clients win over and over again. Now, part of the reason they win, though, is because you also equip them with the magic bullet. Because a lot, it's I a think good, twenty it's, something over twenty percent of all homes right now are being sold for uh, with all cash. I wouldn't doubt that. I I don't. In fact, I'll learn from you. If that's a statistic you've read, that's probably true. It yeah. does seem like a lot. Um, where that would be mediated a little bit. I'm doing a purchase now. Uh, three people are buying a ski house in Utah. Newly constructed. The contractor said you must close by November 16th. I just got the contract. Well, I'm getting the contract Monday. So <laughs> that's not a lot of time to close. So what I suggested was they have enough money to buy it for cash. The next day they turn around and we'll refinance it. It's called a technical refi or reverse purchase. And they'll get the same deal as if it was a purchase. But this way they've assured themselves getting the home. That's the key thing. So here's what I could do for the realtors. And really for my the realtors benefit, but it's really what I do for my clients. It helps to understand the way my industry compensates people. And I mean, underwriters, processors, doctors, funders, management. I mean, you get a base salary, depending on your role, how big that base is, but you get a commission on every transaction that closes. Okay? You don't get paid on loans that don't close. So in these last couple of years, everybody's been really busy with originations. And even today, we're, we're busy. So if you wanted to say, let me get a hypothetical purchase and run it through underwriting, so we look at all your documents and get you an approved loan in advance, most banks and brokers aren't going to do it because no one gets paid. It's a waste of their time. When Bank of the West recruited me, I asked really only for three things, one of which was I want that privilege. So I'm one of the few people in the industry, I think, or, yeah, I'm sure there are others, but I don't come across them. But I try and get my clients to give me their documents in advance. 
run credit. I'll create a purchase scenario that's more than they want to spend. I'll use an interest rate higher than they're going to get. So I built a lot of conservatism and I can get it through my underwriting in about a week. My clients now have approved loans and the benefits are manifold. So, so typically, typically today, at least in most markets, you need to have a letter from your bank that says that you're bankable. You're there's a, 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 a an approval a, approval letter, but my understanding is the approval letter doesn't really mean anything, and you're still looking at going through all that paperwork, and maybe at the end there was some hiccup, and so you're right. saying no, we're not going to do that process. Rather, we're going to have you 100% approved to where all you have to do is plug in the the uh, appraisal, the dollar amount in the appraisal, and you're basically done? That's what you're talking basically about? Done. Basically done. So here's, here's where it's most effective. If you're a seller, I really believe the goal is not to get the highest price for the house. The goal is to get the highest price of the loan that they are sure is going to close. Right. That's it. Because if you're a seller, let's say you give somebody the contract and three weeks later they exercise the loan contingency and have to cancel, they get their money back, they walk away. The seller now is a house that's been shopped over. It actually gets sort of a dingy reputation. People want to know what's wrong. It could be if you did it today and you cancel three weeks from now, you're sitting with a house in December, good luck trying to sell it. You you look bad to so no, the listing agent isn't just trying to get the best price. And the problem with these pre-approval letters, and they can be called pre-qualifying letters, and the, the semantics are so bastardized that I, I, I tend to just repeat what other people tell me, you know, my client. But let's say they've got 15, 20 pieces of paper, they call them pre-approval letters from a bank or a broker, and they'll say some, well, some of them are, two and three pages long filled with detail of fees and costs and rates and closing. And that's what it's going to be in a monthly. I don't bother with any of that because none of that information is meaningful. It's basically made up. Looks good, but it doesn't really look good to the seller. The seller cares about really how much you're going to pay, how much you're putting down. That's it. So they get these pieces of paper, whether they're one, two or three pages long, they've got a stack of them. Half of the banks and brokers, they don't recognize. Some of the ones they do recognize, they're not going to work with, like, good luck getting a pre-approval from Chase. You know, if you've got a listing agent, it's just Chase will say anything, they can't close. So the, the turnaround is, if you're a listing agent, turnaround is the wrong word. If you're a listing agent, you've got these pieces of paper, and you really want to figure out who's solid. I mean, who's really going to get the loan? Because... They know this is a superficial financial examination. They don't have any information to go on except the size of the down payment. So they all understandably equilibrate the size of the down payment with the likelihood of you getting qualified. Sounds logical. There's no truth to it. <laughs> if everybody's pre-approved correctly, they're all good. So... What the seller cares about is getting someone who's going to get the loan. Since a standard part of the purchase contract is a loan contingency, which is your out clause, not having a loan contingency vaults you ahead of all these other people. It's, it becomes almost like cash. It effectively is cash. Right. We close in 17 days, 15 days, 19 days. You know, so the faster we close, the less likely something goes wrong. There's no loan contingency because it's done. So it helps people who only want to put down a small amount, whether they don't have more or they don't want to put down more. I think 10% is all you should put down. Well, if you're in that battle where the seller says, well, you're putting 10% down and he's putting 40% down, you're going to lose. When you go in my way, there's no down payment. It's a done deal. It doesn't come up. You can put 1% down. It's not going to negatively impact your so, Bill, there was this other aspect that you talk about that you're completely different than the rest of the industry, and it has to do with 
the appropriate time in terms of the price of homes or mortgage rates or et cetera, et cetera. And everybody's trying, of course, like they do in the stock market and other places, always trying to, you know, buy at the low or, you know, get another eighth of a point off or something on their interest rate. You have a completely different philosophy. Talk to me about when's the best time to buy a home. Presuming we're talking about buying a home to live in your primary residence, because it's different if you're buying an investment property. Then, as you noted, you're looking at different investments, rates of return, like risk reward, whether it's stocks, real estate, crypto, that's just investments. I have a perspective that maybe is shared with realtors that I think if you're buying a home, it's a place to live. The issues are all about lifestyle. Where do you want to live? Where do you want to? Your kids just go to school. You know, that's what's important. The finances can always be worked out. So I don't know where the rates are going to go tomorrow. Nobody does. There's a mark in economic consensus that the rates are going to stay high for another year or two. Fine. Someone says the rates are going to come down, but they can't tell you when and how much. You're, you may as well play options on the stock market. and You're going to gamble. But if you're buying the home to live in, and you find a house you like, I think that's the time to buy. You have advantages here in Los Angeles or in California because property taxes are basically locked in at your purchase price. So your property tax is not going to skyrocket. Your property insurance generally stays relatively constant. And even if you had to pay a little bit more on a mortgage today because the interest rate's higher than you had hoped for, one, it's your choice in how you spend your money. So you might not want to get that house and that's perfectly okay choice. But there's a reasonableness to things based on statistics that the rates are going to drop at some point and to refinance. So get the house, fix the financing. I, I, there's something in dramaturgy called the crucible effect. You ever, ever hear of this? No, no. It, it's most evident in movies. The crucible effect is when everything comes together at a, almost a singularity. It, it, it compacts the pressure, it magnifies the tension. You see it a lot in thrillers. Yes. The, my best example is uh, Star Wars. Which at the very end, everything's on the line. Luke Skywalker's got to drop those two bombs down a six foot hatch while he's going along an alley that's barely giving a, a, you know, a foot of room on each side, chased by you know, X-Wing fighters and Darth Vader, everything. Along. It, wasn't a mis it wasn't by accident that Spielberg and Lucas put, him, uh, Lucas, I'm saying, put him in that trough, physically compacted him. If he's in outer space, you wouldn't have got that feeling. That's a crucible effect. In that moment in time, everything's critical. And I find a, a commonality with people buying homes the time they're buying that home boy that eight point interest rate is magnified beyond reason is the home worth a million five hundred and twelve thousand i don't i've had people i don't think it's worth more than a million five hundred and seven I mean, excuse me ridiculous i understand it's real to them at the time but i often talk to them about crucible effect and tell them truly that I called clients six months, a year later after a transaction, and I'll ask them how, how things are going. What'd you pay for the house? Oh, uh, a million, a uh, uh, million, a million, five million, six, something like that. And remember your interest rate? Yeah, you got us a great rate. You got it to, uh, we're at four, eight, no, four, seven, five. honey, you don't know, it's <laughs> five. These numbers don't matter in the long run. You're going to be in this house for 7, 10, 20 years. It doesn't matter if financially. I really don't. Think. And I'm not being cavalier about saying money doesn't matter. Dogs matter. <laughs> Dogs matter. That's right. Dogs matter. Um, I'm not cavalier about money. But I'm trying to put it in perspective that you're making a decision about your life and where you're going to be and raise a family. And if you're going to get... If the decision not to buy the house because of an eighth or a quarter point in the interest rate, then it's probably not time for you to buy the house or buy something less. Well, and I liked what you said a minute ago, too. It's like, okay, I'm sitting here with uh, seven and a half or eight, whatever the number is today. 
Um, I could say, well, it might come down in six months. It might come down in a year. So am I going to give up on this house that I wanted? Am I going to continue to rent? Am I going to continue to live in a house I don't like uh, for another six months, a year or longer, waiting for the rate to come down, which may never come down? We can and be meanwhile, in- the houses might go up in price. And then the house might go up in price. It might, it might no longer be available on the market. Um, right. So many things could happen. So if I wait, I might still have to pay that high interest rate. If I buy now and the interest rates go down, as you point out, for a, for a, a minor amount of money, in in some total, you can refinance it and uh, get it at the at a, at a lower rate. Right. And my bank did something this month, which I think is very helpful. We recognize at some point rates are going to come down. Today they're as high as they've been in years. Twenty something okay. years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there, I mean, I can still do. I can still do jumbo rates in the low sixes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for strong borrowers, the rates are still terrific. But are they in the seven and eights for most people? Probably. Um, but my bank point of view was at some point you're going to refinance. Normally refinance costs, you've done it, takes a month. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of hassles. We're going to examine everything. And it can cost you four or $5,000 with all the third-party transaction fees that are required. Right. My bank said, if, if you do a purchase with us and you wait 120 days, we'll refinance you for, I think it's like $750 and one piece of paper. We're basically just going to modify the loan. Wow. Right. Interesting. That's a good deal. So again, it's trying to minimize the risk of buying a house now. I'm much more aware of the Los Angeles market. Right. Um, like, technically San Diego and Orange County and local markets than the whole country. But here in Los Angeles, there's reasons we have a constricted supply. LA has been ranked the worst city in the country to do construction. It's, it's a terrible place to do construction. So I have a lot of builder clients who have 2000 places in Texas or 1830 in, in Kansas City. And they live in Malibu on the beach because they've given up doing construction in Los Angeles. Right. The environmental regulations, the city, the permits, it's, it's, it's a horrible, horrible process. So we're not building more inventory. And many people aren't going to move out of their homes because two years ago they refinanced into these astonishingly great rates. Yes. And they can't afford to give that up. So homes aren't coming on. Exactly. And still, L.A. is a desired place to live. Right. We have solid industries, the entertainment, the engineering, the high tech, you know, the IT group that come down here. We've got the weather, we've got, you know, you, depending on your politics, I mean, it's, if you're coming from the Pacific Rim, you'd prefer to live on the West Coast than the East Coast of America, because if you're visiting it, you're saving five hours of time flying. Right. So right. there's a sense that the LA real estate market will stay strong. Yeah, and, and quite frank, and quite frankly, Bill, I do pay attention to the whole national real estate scene. And guess what? It's tight everywhere. There's no yeah. inventory, and people aren't building for some of the same reasons. But also because the interest rates being this high, the builders are paying a carrying cost on that uh, the whole time that they're building the house on the yeah. land cost and on the materials cost and labor um, until it gets sold. And so the builders are not very excited right now about uh, getting about putting up more more uh, housing. So the inventories, we're probably at least a couple of three years out before inventories can get back into balance anywhere, except and, lousy neighborhoods. Right. <laughs> and I'm sure you've read about some of the hedge funds, big investment funds, who are buying up homes, and they want the rental income, they want the cash flow. Right. So they're not, they're not buying them to fix and flip. They're buying and holding. Well, that's effectively homes taken off the market. So, Bill, there was one other subject matter that I wanted to get into with you today, and that is because I think most people don't get it. Um, most people, I think, believe that when the Fed raises the interest rates, that mm -hmm. all the mortgage companies in the country go, oh, it, the Fed raised it a quarter, we'll raise a quarter. And uh, you explained to me, I don't know, 18 years ago that that just isn't the case. But I think it'd be great if you talk to the talk to my audience and tell them how do mortgage rates really get set? Okay. This is um, taking you inside the sausage factory. Yes. Uh, kosher? <laughs> kosher sausages, yes. Um, 
the role of the Fed is almost universally misunderstood. Okay. And understand, I'm not a pundit, I'm not a political commentator. I just understand how these things work. Mortgages, it helps if you understand that mortgages are bonds. Fixed income, long term, that's what a bond is. And once the bank does a loan, I've, they don't really care what's happened to the person. I've had people who've been dead for years and the family's still making the mortgage payments. <laughs> bank doesn't care. So it's a bond. Bonds are traded on the market called stock market with stocks. The vast majority of the stock market are held by giant institutions. I think something like 75% in America's institutional. And if you simplify it down to where is an investor going to put their money? You've got stocks and bonds. You can separate part of that as options. You get to commodities, foreign currency and trades, but the bulk of it is stocks and bonds. Okay. So imagine the environment we're in now where the stock market is on a real bull run. Okay. Well, until the last few weeks, but yes, in general, it's been on a bull. Yes. Over the last, yeah. um, it has. Last year. Mm -hmm. So if you're an investor, you want to grab onto some of those gains. So you want to invest in the companies that are doing well and making money. So if you're worried about inflation, which the Fed is, one way you can steer money out of the stock market is you raise the Federal Reserve rate, which is the rate at which banks and companies borrow money. If it becomes expensive, well, that's when you need to stop opening up new factories. They're not buying more inventory. They're not hiring more people. You're slowing down the economy. So as the Fed, as the Fed, as the Fed raises their prime rate, the intent is to slow down business performance which arguably slows down in a very broad way their earnings per share. And you get people who take money out of stocks, because now it's starting to sound a little bit risky, and you put it into bonds. And if you're a bond seller, which is say a, a mortgage, it means you can offer a lower interest rate and you're gonna get people wanting to buy your bonds. So it's a very mild, uh, I've looked at, over time, the Fed's movement and interest rates. There's not only no correspondence, but if there's any correspondence, it's inverse. Fed raises rates, bonds go down, mortgages go down. It's obviously not exact, but that's generally the trend. The Fed doesn't control mortgages. They control prime rate, which affects the home equity line, which is a very specific mortgage. But that's not what people are thinking about. So where do they, where do the rates come from? They're systematic for what's going on in the, in the world. And all these world factors affect things. So it's a, it's a closer correlation. I think you told me years ago, a cl closer correlation would be the treasuries, um, which are uh, uh, a, a bond that is the most secure. And then because a mortgage bond would be slightly less secure than a treasury, you might, there, there's a, a difference in the interest rate on those. But in general, that the treasuries might be a closer correlation to the mortgage rates. The people generally use the 10 year bond. I was looking at a thing. Yeah. People generally use the 10 year bond. I don't know if this is worth showing, but I, I use something called Market Watch. Right, right. So here's five months. In five months, the bond has gone from three and a half to five. I mean, that's just a, a, a recent five months. That's a spectacular okay. rise in rates. And that shows the rates are three and a half to five. The reason you're getting mortgage rates of seven and eight is because the banks and the lenders put their margin on top of it. Right. Their, their margin is, it's got to cover the yield spread. It's got to cover their operations. And they're trying to make about one point on everything. So 5% is translated to seven and a half, eight and heading upwards. Right. It's a trend. My, my favorite way of answering the question, but people ask me where are rates going? No, 
I do enough research that I can talk relatively authoritatively about what different parts of the market and the economy and, you know, I get reports from, you know, all the ones we all get. But the best answer is you tell me what you think the market's going to do and I'll find you 10 legitimate experts to back you up. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Because <laughs> for every 10 say it's going up, there's 10 that say it's going down. I mean, who knows? But people, and you see this all the time, people form a opinions and then they find facts and insights and comments that already confirm their opinions of course yes so where are rates going I'm, I'm pleased i've never yet told someone where they're going even the next day and never told anyone where to lock uh, i give my clients a ton of information and it's always more than they've ever heard because my industry doesn't allow us to get paid for our time strictly right. elite right so who wants to spend time with clients? You know, there's pressure from management, pressure from the banks, pressure from everybody. Get more loans, get more loans. So if you're talking to somebody and they don't like what you're saying, or they're very clear to you, they don't qualify today, you're not going to help them until tomorrow. You, most people just dump them and get on to the next. I don't. Uh, I really, really bothers me when people don't, make decisions with good information or they should have information or they should really understand what they're doing. And there's a lot to know. So I take the time to go through that, but make a decision for them or tell them what to do. Never. Well, Bill, those were the subjects that I was hoping we could cover today. Uh, you've got your book um, right up here on my shelf. It is the insider secrets to buying a home. Um, and, uh, more and that the expert tells all it says and does that imply that elon musk referred me <laughs> and elon musk sitting right next to you yes <laughs> uh, and of course and and bill is another tesla driver he's got a model I, three he's been driving for about a year right a little over a year maybe now uh two years two years wow holy mackerel time flies next, a good in, time. Fact, in, in fact next month next saturday is our anniversary your anniversary <laughs> yeah does, does tesla send us a free you know refrigerator or something or <laughs> i don't think i don't maybe <laughs> no i think they'll probably just update my software for free that's right for free yes and over yeah. the air up there uh, over the air update is coming your way that's for sure well bill thanks again for coming on the show and for all of you out there as usual it has been great talking to you is somebody going to join patreon all right i'm going to make a deal uh, this is going to be, uh, I've done this once before. It worked a little bit. Actually got a lot of people joining Patreon the last two weeks. But the last two days, not a single soul. So let's get you up on Patreon. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give you one free audiobook. You can have two free if you want. Or you can have one free audiobook and the Cybertruck bottle opener. How's that? One and one. Okay. If you join at the $10 level, not at the $5 level. If you join at the $5 level, you just get the one book. Now, for, if you're completely new to the channel, this is a bottle opener. It is a refrigerator magnet. It is three millimeter thick, stainless steel, really, really tough. Comes in a very cool magnetic box that makes it a great gift item. Um, so, you know, it's it's got all kinds of people now buying them as gifts as a result of the fact that I have people, so many people that wanna buy them as gifts and they're putting in these larger orders I do have it all down. I think I put it all down below. I'll have to double check and make sure that it's up to date. Three, they're normally 25 bucks a piece. You get two for, <laughs> for $45. You get three for $60, okay? You get 100 for $210, and you get 200 for $400. Gets you all the way down to $20 a piece. If you are out of the country, I need you to add another uh, 20 bucks to that for freight whichever one of those ones you pick and then if you are um and then please let me know camo or regular and of course you can mix and match if you buy quantities however you want to set that up um so is there anything else i have left for you tonight i think i've said it all i have enjoyed speaking with you yet again click the link below to get your paperback kindle or audiobook now